part two, Cricket as Vegas. Uncle Kit. I don't know why Danny went to Vegas. We played cards all the time, and I even told him that he should try and at least get a side hustle going. There's plenty of card rooms in L.A., and like most tables in general, they're filled with idiots. He could have made his run here. He would go into spells playing cards with his buddies and earning some beer money, but I always told him to get serious and make some real cash. Plenty of guys much stupider than him pay for their family trips to Disney World with what they take from even stupider guys at Commerce or Hustler. It's not even like he had anything else going on. I told him he had nothing to lose, and if he got good enough, he'd even be able to make his living that way. Anyone who works a 9-to-5 can tell you anything's better than that. I don't care if you lay bricks or organize spreadsheets. It's all hell if you stay long enough. I'm also the one who taught him how to play. I know a lot of people try to take credit for that, but I was the first one to put a deck in his hands. I wouldn't even think he could read at that time. He used to bring over his Go Fish cards with the big-ass cartoons on them, and my wife would play with them for hours. I'd come home from work, and they'd be at the table making pears. She told me one night that he beat her pretty often, and she was worried that maybe she was losing her mind or just really stupid. She wasn't sure which was worse. Her grandma had something like that, dementia-related issues. Anyway, she told me I should play with them, if for nothing else to engage with the little guy, who didn't have much of a father figure. I love my sister way too much to start going down that road. So the next night, I sit with Danny and Melody, and we play a few rounds. I find out real quick that Danny is a natural. I'm not going to sit there and test my hypothesis with a bunch of 5-inch cards with cartoon friggin' squids on them, so I bust out my bicycle deck. We start simple, same rules as goldfish, but we make the pairs with the real cards. Danny nails it. So I tell him that if you can make a set of five of the same suit, that's double the points or whatever. No problem, he still nails it. So I decide right then and there, tomorrow, I teach him the hands and how they rank. In a pair of sessions, this kid's got it down. Hold them and Omaha. So we play hand after hand, night after night, all summer long. I even tell his mom to let him spend the night so we can get some real work in. By this point, he forgets all about go fish, much to my wife's disapproval. She's still on me for teaching him a gambling game, even as I explained to her time and time again that it's not a gambling game, it's a strategy game. You bet on anything and it's a gambling game, for Christ's sake. Anyway, summer finally ends, and I'm telling Danny that he's got to stick with this. He's got the kind of mind for this game, not like me. So he says sure, and I tell him we'll get a game going soon, some of my work buddies. They'll get a kick out of it, and I'll roast him to kingdom come the first time my nephew fleeces him. It was fun until I realized that that was my money Danny was walking off with, too. I make a lot of jokes, ask anyone, but I seriously had to stop playing in games with him in the mix. I mean, I wasn't going to be the guy who has to lower the limit when everyone else is having a good time, so I just made an excuse about having a headache or being too tired. My wife held the irony of that one over me for a while. Danny was bad with bankroll management even back then. I think he was 14 when he punted his old roll on that nasty hand. He had kings, and the board was a nice run of eight jack, queen, rainbow. The turn came down an ace, and Danny took a moment before raising up 30 big blinds. The villain was a big stack, and he went ahead and pushed all in to flex what came out to just shy of a grand. It was just too much money for a kid like that to keep his head. Danny stopped for about the longest I'd ever seen him think. I'm just sitting back putting him on kings, which meant the villain did too, and he probably had the ace. At least that's the story he was telling. I'm sweating more than him thinking about how my sister's going to kick my ass if he loses all his money and she finds out that I'm the one who set up this game. Anyway, Danny flicks his chips over his fingers for a minute or so and tosses it in the pot to call. He shows his kings, and the other guy shows his ace jack, and the boy runs out with something like a two of diamonds. Danny didn't say a word, just stared at the cards on the table as they got shuffled back into the deck and his opponent wrangled in the past four years of his poker career with just one scoop of his fat-ass arm. He left the table quietly as the game kept going, and I told him this was between us, but you guys understand. I found him crying in our master bathroom. I waited for him to come out and try to tell him this happens. It's gambling. That's why rule number one is you never bet what you can't cover. Luckily, it was a cash game, and he was a kid. He'd have a place to stay and a warm meal tomorrow. He'll be fine. Take the lesson and keep playing. I emphasized that he wasn't the first guy to have his kings cracked. Told him that probably won't even be the last time that particular hand runs out on him. Little did I know that the next time his big pair would crack would be when he lost my money. This was when he was about, probably 23. He always had a hard time getting on his feet. 
something like being born under a bad star. He was rounding a little back then, but again, just for some side cash. At this time, he had been let go from a job delivering documents for a law firm, and he wasn't going to make rent, so he needed to play a little more. He had it in his head that if he got into a bigger game, he'd get out of his problem faster. He called me and asked to borrow a grand or so, claimed he only needed two bullets and he'd be good. Of course, I told him to piss off, but what I didn't think to do was to warn my wife, because of course, he would just turn and ask her, which he did, and he got his money. He did well for a while, got his rent paid, but did he turn and use that extra time to get his act together? Maybe another job? Maybe get something going so he could pay us back? Nope, he kept playing. He went a month or so burning through his big game until it all came crashing down on a pair of cracked aces. He finally answered my call about a week after he went under, and he almost burst into tears again, explaining to me that he didn't have the money. I changed the subject, and we just talked about hands for a few hours, and I told him the places where he screwed up. Then I chewed him out for breaking the key rules of never betting what he couldn't cover. He was still a baby, thank God, and still hadn't taken any credit from people who could really hurt him. He told me he was going to live with his mom for a while until they got everything together. I told him to just get it to me when he could. I wasn't hurting too bad, so I let him off the hook. Temporarily. Not enough to just tell him to forget it. He still needed to take that responsibility. But what was the point in stressing him out even more? He still hasn't paid me back. <laughs> Liam. Everyone in LA loves Vegas. It's just a quick flight away or a cool road trip. We feel enough like foreigners to enjoy the novelty, but we're close enough and go there so often we also feel like locals. At the time, we expect to be pampered like guests. We also feel superior to everyone around us because we know some things they don't, like where the bathrooms are or where to get a good martini. We used to go all the time after we turned 21. Me, Ken, Danny, and whoever wanted to tag along. We would just get one room and crash like the six of us in there. Guys, girls, friends, family, it didn't matter. None of us ever had any money, so it was the only way we could do Vegas. We all worked like in movie theaters or retail, so when we went, we just drank our own beers from our ice chests and walked around. We'd go in a bar or two and just nurse a drink. We wouldn't go to any shows. We couldn't afford to shop. Sometimes we'd hit the pool and check out the girls, maybe try to get one to come back to the room. We had a policy for making sure no one else was in there if one of us did get lucky, but we almost never did. We definitely didn't gamble, except for Danny, of course. After a night of drinking, goofing off, and just getting in any kind of trouble we could find, we'd all hit up some cheap greasy spoon and then head to the room to sleep until the sun set again. Not Danny. He went straight for the tables. He was good company because I knew all he wanted to do was play cards for 72 hours straight, but he partied with us and had a good time. Then instead of crashing, he did his thing when we were passed out. Was he on drugs? I can't say for sure, but I never saw it. But I also never saw him sleep. The only thing I saw was the cash he'd come back to the room with. He didn't always win, but he would bring stacks of thousands of dollars all the time. He always called dibs on the safe, which was a waste of time because none of us had anything worth putting in there. He was the only one who came back to L.A. with more money. Again, maybe there were drugs involved, because he was always broke. If he was so good at cards, why did he never have any money? Danny and I are a lot alike. I lived in New York for almost eight years. Me and my girlfriend moved over there just because. She was an actress, and she wanted to try and see if she could fare better over there. I didn't care. I was in love and always down to change things up. We broke up after a year, and I stayed. She moved back to L.A. a few months later. I was working at a high school in Staten Island, and I was actually loving it. I had a group of friends who were always a good time. 
I loved the school and my students. It seemed perfect. I tried to get Danny to come visit, but he never did. When he moved to Vegas, I waited for my invite to come see him, and that never came either. Eventually, I decided to come back and start another chapter closer to the family. I think after a while, it was like the adventure was over. I loved New York, and I'd visit as much as I could, but it was time to come home. Thinking back on it, it seems like it was just a weekend or something. For the longest time, I was calling myself a New Yorker, and I had already developed the arrogance amidst the tourists laughing at people who brought up Times Square, then bragging about how I hadn't been there in years. The hardest part was leaving the students. The way it worked over there, I'd sometimes teach kids from freshman year through the end, so they'd become kind of like my own kids. I'd gotten to know so many of them so well, the ones that graduated too. I knew there was almost no chance I'd see them again, and that was hard. Like Danny, I'm a nomad, and it's a tough life. We get the freedom and all that, but it's hard because there's no way to not form relationships. These little spells like eight years in New York or 15 in Vegas are especially hard because they feel like they were supposed to last forever. I can only imagine how that feels in the context of his marriage. It's like when a parent dies, assuming they live to a ripe old age like Danny's mom. Since Matt shouldered a lot of the responsibility that their dad had run away from, it was like Danny was an only child. So it was just him and his mom for so long, literally his entire life. Then she's gone. Like, now what? Have to figure out how to drive the rest of the way on three tires. Danny had to do the same thing with his wife. Sometimes I think about how He might have just been starting to believe she could feel that empty space. Then she goes and leaves too. Actually, one thing the nomad life can help with is just that. We always know how to move, how to adapt, how to rebuild. It's the double-edged sword of being able to move freely, but then getting caught in something we want to last forever. Then when it runs out, we can roll right out of it. The thing is, that only works for so long. It's easy to start over at 22. I'm 57 now, and I don't think I have another restart in me. Danny's getting old too, and I could see how it might look like he's got nothing to show for it outside of some cool stories. I don't know how he's supposed to start over. I just hope he doesn't try to do it how he's done everything else before, all alone. Danny. There's a Christian song with the lyric, God draws straight with crooked lines. It's a nice thought. Not super clear on whether or not that line is tracking up or down, though. But maybe that's the point. Not everyone gets happy endings. Not all lives trend upward. The purpose of the crooked lines could be that we all still get little ups, so it's important to enjoy them. Otherwise, you're miserable on potentially a short and long-term basis. I've had tons of ups, like really big ups, and maybe there's even still more coming. I don't know. Kind of funny, because when you gamble for a living, it's really easy to see the trends. Guess it's the same in almost any business, though. It's definitely unique to a game like poker with luck worked right into it. The math nerds try really hard to put it all into numbers and use probability to make it more predictable, but the heart and soul of this game is luck. Anyone who's played more than a few thousand hands knows that you can play perfectly and still hit major downswings. I definitely did not play perfectly, in poker or in this rough metaphor. So maybe all in all I have trended upward. Like, I've made every mistake there is, and I'm not dead or in jail. So, in the grand scheme of things, based on my choices and the hand dealt to me, I could very well be performing at an optimum level. Or maybe this is just a roundabout way to make myself feel good about the life I built, or the lack of. People always ask why I moved to Vegas. 
They don't ask the thousands of other Californians who make the switch. But because I play cards, they want to know. I don't really know. As my mom or anyone else would have told you, I don't think a lot before I do things. It makes me a good poker player, maybe. But it definitely messes with every other aspect of my life. I needed the change. I needed new fish. I needed to be alone. I had too many needs. LA was always there, and as I might be about to confirm, it'll always be there whenever I need to come back. Guess that makes me luckier than most. My mom told me she wanted me to play full-time, right before she died. She always said that, though. This might sound cold, but people, everyone, tries to sound poetic when they know they're about to die. We never pulled punches when we talked, but we also kept our boundaries. She always told me to just borrow some money from her and try to make it in the 510 games around LA. She told me I could even stay with her rent-free and see how it works. Big part of that was my fault. Sometimes I exaggerated my win rate. I mean, so does everyone else, but I didn't want a handout. I should say, any more handouts than she already gave me. Remember how I said it was a testament to my luck that I wasn't in jail or on the street? Well, that luck was made flesh in my mom. I had a lot of good family support to bail me out throughout my life, but my mom was always my first call. Then that moved to Amy. Now, I don't know. I'll tell you one thing I know for a fact. If you're thinking about playing cards for a living or just moving to Vegas, it's cold as shit. Remember, this is an Angelino talking, but this is miserable. I'm repeating myself now, but I didn't think this through before I started walking. If you ever want to doubt exactly how stupid I am, just remember that I literally walked to my room at the Wynn, and instead of going up and grabbing a jacket, for whatever reason that made sense to me at that moment, I just kept walking back in the other direction. Not planning things has its price. The flamingo is right here. I can just stop in and buy a hoodie. It's a funny thing because being broke in this country means I can still buy new clothes or food. Maybe even find a discounted bus ticket. Other people literally starve in their huts. Their kids just die in their arms. That's being broke. Not this. I don't know what this is. Just whining instead of withering. Suffering more in the mind than in the body. Then again, who can we trust to draw the line between real torment and just complaining? Does starving hurt more than losing the love of your life? Is freezing to death worse than being left to live with nothing at all? It's all just mental exercises. Meaningless in that they don't help guide the next move. What's worse? Who cares? I'm cold now. And I'm going to remedy that by buying a jacket. Which might just be the last dollars I ever give this town. All I can say for sure is that there's now. There's what I'm feeling. The rest is uh, to be continued. That was Crooked as Vegas, the second part of the five-part finale, Other People's Money. Make sure you subscribe so you can get the rest of the episodes every Monday in November. We're going until part five, the big, big finale. Also, my debut novel is available, Angie's Move. It's on Amazon right now, ebook and paperback. Great gift, and you'll be supporting a local and independent author. I self-publish this. It's all me. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next Monday for part three, Snap Call.